you who have decided to join us for this final public lecture of the Japan program, which is the final lecture of our, at least this academic year, of our course uh, on Japan's foreign and security policy. Now we decided to zoom out in this final lecture and look at Japan's involvement in global multilateral uh, mechanisms and institutions such as UN, G7, G20. Um, for an obvious reason, we have heard throughout this course, and especially at the beginning in the introduction, um, the importance that uh, Japan attaches to uh, the promotion of, of multilateralism and, and human security, be it in the region uh, or globally. So the question that uh, I think is, is inevitably uh, asked now is how effective has this uh, decades long uh, involvement, involvement been, how well did it serve Japan's uh, national security interests, how well did it serve the region or the world, um, and how has it evolved? Uh, there is actually made much, much to be to be learned and asked, and I'm uh, delighted to be here in, in the best possible company. Uh, of two distinguished experts who have uh, written and published extensively on those topics. Uh, which is, first of all, uh, Dr. Professor Akiko Fukushima from the Tokyo Foundation of, for Policy Research. Uh, Akiko Sensei is also uh, a professor at the Tokyo Sacred Heart University and has been a well-known figure on uh, Japan's involvement in development and global governance issues. Welcome very much to um, to our lecture. It's a pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, and as a second speaker, uh, Professor Hugo Dobson uh, from the University of Sheffield. Uh, Hugo has been a professor of Japan's international relations and again has published extensively on those topics. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to his comments and reactions. We'll uh, keep to the usual um, We'll keep to the usual uh, setting, so uh, Fukushima Sensei will speak for about 45 minutes, that will be the, the main lecture, and after this we will um, pass the floor to Professor Dobson for his remarks and open the floor to a Q&A uh, session for the last 30 minutes, so um, think of your questions, um, try to have them in mind, and if you have them, uh, please post it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will record this lecture and post it on the YouTube channel. I think that's it for me as a housekeeping rule. And I will pass the floor to Professor Fukushima uh, to, for, her, uh, for her lecture. Here we go. And uh, uh, Akiko san, we cannot hear you. Is it muted? Yes, now it's good. Oh, thank you, Eva. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to be invited to your program today on the topic of multilateralism. Um, in the international relations, multilateralism has long been placed in the shadows of bilateralism, despite the repeated assertions that uh, multilateralism matters. However, this time around, against the background of changing global relations and geopolitics, multilateralism genuinely matters, I believe. While we explore how we should adapt to changing geopolitics beyond the current crisis of COVID-19, we recently heard a couple of positive news or multilateral engagements, haven't we? I trust Eva has selected the topic of multilateralism at the most opportune timing. In my initial talk, as my second slide, next slide. Eva, can we go to the next slide? Yes, uh, in my initial talk, I would like to discuss first how Japan has engaged in global and regional multilateralism in the past seven decades. Secondly, I would like to delve into the evolution of Japan's logic of multilateralism, as well as 
rationale behind the evolution that to bring us up to 2021. And in this section, I would like to answer some of the tough questions ever posed at the very beginning of this lecture. Although I will place emphasis on security uh, multilateralism as requested, geopolitics and geoeconomics are deeply intertwined in Japan's case. Thus, please pardon me for alluding to economic multilateralism as well. I very much look forward to the comments by Professor Dobson and to our discussion with colleagues participating this meeting online. Now, let me begin. As for Japan's engagement in global multilateralism, let me first take up the case of the United Nations. Going back to February 4th, 1957, Prime Minister Kishi Nobusuke gave three pillars of Japan's post-war diplomacy. One of the pillars was to center Japan's foreign policy around the United Nations. This is called as Japan's UN-centered diplomacy. Japan has pursued its UN-centered diplomacy despite the Cold War time paralysis of the organization and despite Japan's constitutional constraints on its role on collective security. This UN-centered diplomacy has been maintained up to now. There we can observe consistency in Japan's engagement in global multilateralism. As shown in this slide, since Japan joined the UN in 1956, with the foreign minister Shigemitsu hoisting the Japanese flag at the UN headquarter, individuals such as Akashi Yasushi, who led the ANTAC in Cambodia, Ogata Sadako, who led UNHCR as High Commissioner and incumbent UN uh, Undersecretary General high, and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Nakamitsu Izumi, and others have contributed to the work of the UN on peace operations, refugee support, and disarmament and others. Japan boasts a unique approach to UN policies that stands on three traditional pillars, nuclear disarmament, economic development, and humanitarian assistance. Japan has also engaged in UN reform for its accountability so that the UN can cope more effectively with the precarious issues faced by the global economy, the global community. Now, Moving on to the next slide, Japan has made major financial contribution to the work of the organization as shown in this slide. Japan is currently the third largest contributor to the UN regular budget after the US and China since 2019, followed by Germany, UK, France, and Italy. As a matter of fact, Japan was the second largest contributor to the UN regular budget after the United States from 1985 to 2018. Moving on to the next table, next slide. Japan is also the third largest contributor to UN PKO budget as shown in this slide. I hasten to add, however, that financing is not the only contribution Japan has made to the UN. Next slide. Former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, in his speech to the General Assembly of the United Nations in September 2014, said Japan has been now and will continue to be a force providing momentum for peace. Japan has expressed its commitment to be a peace enabler. In December 2013, Japan's National Security Strategy, or abbreviated as NSS, which I participated in drafting, launched a Japanese policy to promote proactive contribution to peace based on international cooperation. The NSS emphasized the importance of strengthening diplomacy at the United Nations. With the, initi with the initiative of uh, 
Ogata Sadako, High Commissioner for uh, UNHCR, uh, Japan emphasizes seamless assistance to conflict-ridden countries from peace settlement to peacekeeping, peace building, and reconstruction with the guiding principle of human security as Eva mentioned in the very beginning. This seamless assistance has been implemented by JICA in, for example, in, Minna, in Mindanao in Philippines. JICA has been involved in uh, the conflict of uh, Mindanao uh, before peace accord was signed. This is based on Ogata's strong belief that our assistance should be seamless from peace settlement all the way to reconstruction. Japan also participates in UN peace operations since 1992, when Japan enacted the International Peace Cooperation Law. Since then, Japan has been making personnel and in-kind contributions to assist efforts led by the UN and other organizations to Cambodia, Timor-Leste, Golan Heights, Haiti, South Sudan, and others. I myself, as a research person, uh, visited uh, Timor-Leste and South Sudan uh, while Japanese contingent was there. Japan has so far sent 12,000 personnel to the UN peacekeeping operations. Moreover, at the 2014 summit on strengthening <coughs> operations, Prime Minister Abe highlighted Japan's commitment to capacity building to contribute to the field of peace building. This is implemented under United Nations TPP, Triangular Partnership Program, to enhance the preparedness and effectiveness of peacekeeping missions through cooperation among troop contributing countries and supporting member states and the UN Secretariat. This TPP aims to enhance capacity of engineering, medical, communication, and camp security for peacekeepers through provision of professional training and equipment. Also, Japan introduced the peace and security legislation effective in 2016, which allows new opportunities for Japanese engagement in UN peacekeeping operations and other security measures as Tokyo seeks to demonstrate greater flexibility for Japan's self-defense forces deployments. Japan contributes to peace and stability of the world as a responsible member of the global society, as no country can maintain peace alone. Now, turning to uh, next uh, slide, as uh, another illustration of Japan's engagement in global multilateralism, I would like to uh, take up the cases of G7 and G20. As Professor Dobson will delve into these cases, I will be very brief. Japan is the founding member of the G7 and is the only Asian power represented in G7 so far. For Japan, G7 summit is an important platform for its diplomacy as Japan does not have other multilateral summits such as uh, EU, NATO, and other transatlantic multilateral summits that other G7 leaders attend together and discuss their cooperation. And this was particularly so before the launch of G20. Although G7 initially focused on economy, it has broadened its agenda. For example, Japan has also promoted discussions on agenda related to human security since Prime Minister Obuchi when Japan hosted the G7 summit in Isashima in 2016, Prime Minister Abe led discussions on the world economy, quality infrastructure assistance, and universal health. If I can go to the next slide, as shown in this, uh, if I can go to the next slide, as shown in this well-known uh, photo of the summit in Canada, uh, leaders discussed their joint statement on trade, namely to promote uh, free trade and to prevent protectionism. I have discovered that uh, Professor Dobson is planning to use the same uh, 
photograph or a photograph of this nature. So I'll be very brief. Uh, from Japanese perspective, as the opinions were divided among the seven on uh, trade, free trade, Prime Minister Abe offered a compromise, bridging the gap among the views held by the seven. Upcoming G7 in UK in June, we'll discuss our common concern, including COVID-19 climate action and other issues, regional issues, including North Korea. Prime Minister Suga is preparing to contribute to the discussion. As the G7 foreign ministers meeting held earlier this month in London revealed, the G7 agenda is no longer limited to economic issues, but also includes other geopolitical issues. Let me move on to the next slide. Japan has also joined G20, which was launched in 1999 after the financial crisis. If I can go to the next slide of uh, G20. When Japan hosted the G20 summit in Osaka in 2019. Uh, Eva, can we go to the next slide? I'm, I'm sorry, Akiko san, I'm trying. It's very strange. Uh, I can't. Well, then. Um, part of your I, slide or not? I will move on and. Uh, when Japan hosted uh, G20 summit in Osaka in 2019, uh, it was a time when the US under, thank you, President uh, Trump took a strong position against China on trade. Therefore, media focused more on US-China bilateral summit rather than G20 discussions. I would like to note here that multilateralism offers a great opportunity for bilateral summits so much so that bilateralism often overshadows multilateralism. G20 in Osaka was exactly such a case. However, Japan, in addition to managing the adoption of the joint statement, led the substantive discussions on digital connectivity and plastic garbage dumping into oceans. We all know that such global issues have security implications. The photo on right hand side shows a site meeting held on digital connectivity where data free flow was trust, DFFT was discussed. Japan managed to persuade both the United States and China to participate in the discussion on digital, which was quite a remarkable accomplishment, mindful of positions taken by the US and China on digital, as exemplified in the case of 5G and Huawei. This shows that Japan has made efforts to sustain global multilateralism even at a time when some leaders turned their back to it. The time doesn't allow me to delve into Japan's role in other international institutions, but Japan has also been making efforts to support works of such institutions as WTO, WHO, UNESCO, UNDP, etc. In fact, the Japanese government had set a goal of sending 1,000 Japanese individuals to international institutions as staff by 2025 and has already sent more than 900 as of now. Now, let me turn to regional uh, multilateralism. Different from Europe, where numerous regional institutions have been established soon after the end of the Second World War, Asia has long lacked comparable treaty based uh, regional institutions. Thus, uh, Japan didn't have any regional institutions to join immediately after the end of the Second World War. However, uh, over the years, uh, Asia has developed this much uh, regional architectures. On security, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or SEATO, was created in 1954, but could not function nor prevent the Vietnam War. SEATO was sub subsequently disbanded without developing a genuine mechanism for security. Nevertheless, over the years, the region has developed regional cooperation ranging from APEC ARF to East Asia Summit and ADMM Plus and so forth. As the region has come to host so many institutions, the architecture has been called as a spaghetti bowl or a noodle soup. However, they are not in chaos, 
but constitute a multi-layered structure for regional cooperation. Now, let me move on to the next slide. Japan has been active in creating and supporting regional architectures in Asia and broader Asia. Geographical footprint of regional architecture has evolved over the years from Pan-Pacific initially to Asia-Pacific, East Asia, and uh, Indo-Pacific. Initially, Japan led efforts to create Track 1.5 Pan-Pacific Corporation in the form of PECC and PBEC in 1970s and 80s, focusing on economic uh, cooperation. Then Japan took initiative in launching Asia Pacific Regional Cooperation uh, in 1989, and Japan took initiative with Australia in launching APEC. In the 1990s, witnessing a successful launch of APEC, ASEAN took the initiative in launching a security regionalism, ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF. In late 1990s, ASEAN further took initiatives in launching ASEAN-centered regional architectures in East Asia, such as ASEAN Plus Three, namely Japan, China, and ROK, East Asia Summit, and on security ADMM Plus. ASEAN has been sitting in the driver's seat of the East Asia Regional Cooperation. Despite criticisms on lack of substance, these regional architectures have survived in parallel and have evolved to be a platform for regional cooperation. Despite evolution of uh, geographical footprint for regional cooperation, I would like to emphasize that none of uh, these uh, geographical footprints uh, or regional institutions thereof was disbanded except Seattle. They all survive up to today. Now, next slide. Furthermore, the region opted for more agreement-based regional cooperation, namely EPA, such as TPP and RCEP. In the late uh, 2010s, when US under former President Trump turned its back to multilateralism and opted to leave TPP, Japan took initiative to rescue the treaty, calling remaining 11 members to stick to the treaty by revising some part of it and concluded in a form of comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. On March 8th, 2018 in Santiago, Chile, 11 Trans-Pacific countries signed the CPTPP. Moving on to the next slide, Japan has also engaged in yet another regional EPA. In the summer of 2011, Japan with China uh, agreed to develop a plan for regional economic integration in East Asia, which led to the establishment of Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. And uh, this uh, was, uh, signed in 2019. Unfortunately, India subsequently pulled out as its agricultural and industrial sectors strongly opposed RCEP. RCEP, which will go into effect before long, represents approximately 30% of global GDP. Next slide. In this section on Japan role of regional multilateralism, lastly, I would like to take up the case of free and open Indo-Pacific or FOIP vision. As many of you are aware of, Japan is one of the earlier initiators of the Indo-Pacific. Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific has been echoed by countries within the region and beyond. Indo-Pacific concept should be familiar to colleagues participating in this call as France, Germany, and Netherlands have respectively launched their concepts and the EU has recently announced its strategy on Indo-Pacific cooperation. Why has Japan broadened the regional scope from Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific? A concept of Indo-Pacific has emerged as the region had become a center of global economic dynamism in the 21st century, home to roughly half of the global economy. This economic weight of the region has been a shared magnet for all who have already launched their Indo-Pacific concept. Included in this magnet is the important sea lane of communication from Northern Africa to the Pacific. 
here arrive the key notion of connectivity. I would argue that the Indo-Pacific is more than a geographical concept and includes security, economy, and diplomacy. Although there are debates over who took the original initiative on the concept of Indo-Pacific, Japan at the least is one of the first to launch its concept. On August 22nd, 2007, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe spoke at the Indian Parliament and alluded to the con confluence of the two seas, the Indian and Pacific Oceans, which is the origin of POIP. In his second government, Prime Minister Abe officially launched free and open Indo-Pacific in August 2016 at the sixth Tokyo International Conference in African Development held in Kenya. As uh, Foreign Minister Motegi explains, FOIP has three pillars. One, establishing a free and open order based on the rule of law. Second, pursuit of economic prosperity through ensuring connectivity. Third, commitment to peace and stability, including maritime security. I would like to point out that uh, free and open Indo-Pacific is an inclusive concept. Diplomatic Blue Book of 2020 clearly describes that the concept of free and open in the Pacific does not intend to create new institutions or compete with existing institutions, and no country is excluded from the partnership. As this slide shows, Prime Minister Suga has inherited the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Initiative and has confirmed his cooperation on the Indo-Pacific with his ASEAN colleagues last fall, as well as with Quad leaders in March 2021. When Quad leaders met online, they agreed to promote a free, open, rules-based order rooted in international law to advance security and prosperity and counter threats to both in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. In the joint statement entitled The Spirit of the Quad, the four leaders, US, Japan, uh, India, and Australia, agreed to promote concrete cooperation on vaccine, climate action, cooperation on international standards and innovative technologies through working groups. Working groups are now underway. When Prime Minister Suga met with President Biden on April 16th in Washington, D.C. in person, they agreed to further cooperation in free and open in the Pacific. The leaders issued the joint statement, which said that we reaffirm our co commitment to achieving prosperity and maintaining economic order in the Indo-Pacific region while engaging with other like-minded partners. Next slide. Japan also wishes to cooperate with European nations on the Indo-Pacific. On January 25th, 2021, Foreign Minister Motegi attended the EU Foreign Affairs Council online. Motegi explained J Japan's vision of FOIP and said that FOIP is an inclusive concept, open to cooperation with any countries which share the same values and vision. He also mentioned that Japan welcomes the interest in the Indo-Pacific grow in Europe. FOIP is the first foreign policy regional strategy that Japan took initiative and has successfully brought other democracies within and beyond the region on board. Japan is practicing free and open Indo-Pacific on quality infrastructure, connectivity, and maritime security. Time doesn't allow me to go into the details of implementation, but using the next slide, I would like to show one uh, example of uh, EU-Japan Djibouti joint naval exercise for the sake of maritime security. On May 10th, the EU, Japan, and Djibouti carried out a trilateral joint naval exercise in the Gulf of Aden for the first time. This is after the adoption of last month of an EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, which called for more uh, such joint activities to promote maritime security in the region. Joint exercises of this nature enhance maritime security in the Indo-Pacific and also assist the uh, coast guards of countries in the region for their capacity building. 
Now let me move on to my second uh, segment of my talk. Uh, this is evolution of Japan's logic of multilateralism. In the past seven decades, Japan has actively engaged in global and regional multilateralism. I would like to analyze evolution of Japan's logic of multilateralism and rationale behind it. I would argue that multilateral impulse has been strong in Japan's post-war foreign policy thinking, but in practice, it has been elusive, as Eva has pointed out. The first logic, earnest supporter of global multilateralism, Japan's engagement in multilateralism began from an earnest supporter of multilateralism in the earlier decades of uh, 1950s and 60s as exemplified in Japan's UN Center Diplomacy and in its active membership in international institutions, ranging from UNESCO to UN itself, then to OECD and so on. When we look back, immediately after the end of the Second World War, none in the international community expected Japan to lead multilateralism, be it for economy or for security. Japan itself was busy to recover from the ashes and to be accepted in the international society as a member. Moreover, different from Europe, Japan did not have regional institutions that it could align with. In the 1950s and 60s, Asia did not have regional institutions comparable to European coal and steel community or NATO. The best it was hoped for was for Japan to participate in global institutions and to be abided by the rules of multilateralism and to contribute as a royal supporter of multilateral cooperation. Thus, Japan opted for the global institution, the United Nations, for its global security multilateralism. Japan's UN centered diplomacy, as I have described, was the approach Japan opted to gain trust and to be readmitted to the international community. Japan, as its economy grew to be the second largest in the 80s, faced with the harsh criticisms for not playing its role commensurate with its economic power, particularly in the field of security. With its constitutional constraints in using force beyond its national border, Japan has explored a way to combine its economic strengths with law and security as exemplified in the notion of comprehensive security. Comprehensive security was first publicized in the late 1970s in a report by Prime Minister Ohira Masayoshi's study group. The group identified broader threats to security beyond military ones and included economy, trade disruption, food security, energy security, and natural disasters. Thus, the report argued that military means alone would not be sufficient to protect national security and that comprehensive security requires non-military measures. This concept was developed for Japan to play its role in broader security domain internationally. Having comprehensive security in mind, Japan had to turn out to be more active in assisting developing countries in need through its official development assistance ODA. Furthermore, Japan took initiative in building track 1.5 regional multilateralism that led to the creation of PBEC and PECC. In late 1980s, Japan saw the lack of track one regional institutions in the Asia Pacific places the region on disadvantage. Around this time, Europe developed and strengthened its own regional institutions. The United States concluded North American Free Trade Agreement or NAFTA. Moreover, Japan saw a close type transatlantic regionalism on the rise. Since Japanese economy relied heavily on exports, Japan was concerned as it witnessed negotiations at GATT. Japan felt a lack of collective voice from Asia would put the region on disadvantage at global negotiations. Japan also wanted to pursue open, not closed regionalism to foster trade liberalization and facilitation. 
Thus came the launch of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC Forum in 1989, finding a common cause with Australia on the agenda for regional cooperation, Japan and Australia acted together. Both were highly dependent on US forward engagement in Asia and on the maintenance of open global trading systems. Both were concerned about the potential for trading blocks in North America and Europe. However, Japan did not take an explicit leadership in launching APEC. Japan let Australia take the leadership of proposing the idea officially when Prime Minister Hook visited Republic of Korea in January 1989. Japan thought that the history of Japanese multilateralism in Asia, namely Greater East Asia Core Prosperity Sphere, makes Asian states weary of Japanese leadership. Indeed, this is one of the major obstacles to Japan's multilateral aspirations in the region in the past. Thus came a pet first meeting held in Canberra in November 1989, coincidentally when the Berlin Wall crumbled down. So this is a phase of leaving from behind. Then beginning in the latter half of the 1990s, East Asia gradually became the crucial region for Japan and Asia. This became especially important after the Asian financial crisis in, the 19, uh, in 1997. Japan took initiative in advancing financial cooperation after the crisis and led efforts in establishing the Chiang Mai initiative. I would like to note that the crisis often lead to the launch of multilateral institutions or a cooperation. I also would like to note that in joining East Asia regionalism, Japan did not abandon Asia Pacific regionalism, but kept it in parallel with East Asia regionalism. Japan maintained its active participation in ARF, APEC, and other Asia Pacific architectures. One can observe institution hedging in keeping both as multi-layered regional architecture. Now, Moving on to uh, and uh, before I move on, uh, and here uh, one can observe institution hedging, institutional hedging in keeping both as uh, multi-layered regional architecture. Moving on to the last uh, circle, since uh, the early 2010s. China's rapid rise has presented many challenges for Japan. Chinese GDP surpassed that of Japan in 2010, and China became the second largest economy in the world. Japan had to face the fact that balance of power between China and Japan was drastically shifting, and the Japanese government was forced to deal with this new reality. Meanwhile, China has long enhanced its military buildup and has taken assertive actions in South and East China seas. The rise of China led to a shift in the balance of power between the United States and China. Chinese claims on Senkaku Island have become highly assertive since the end of 2000s, leading to an increase in tensions between Japan and China over maritime security. To address unpredictable future of strategic competition between China and US, Japan has been promoting approaches to regional economic integration. As I have alluded to, Japan led the efforts to conclude CPTPP and RCEP. These are also part of uh, institutional hedging. A national security strategy or NSS Japan has launched its proactive contribution to peace, which is reflected in the recent policies of free and open Indo-Pacific and Quad and others. And SS also emphasized collaboration with like-minded countries, both on economy, security, and development. NSS, as well as its development cooperation charter, have praised the notion of human security as a guiding principle, which has been further enhanced after the eruption of COVID-19. In the evolution of Japan's logic of multilateralism, Japan keeps all these four elements in parallel. Uh, as for uh, schematics, I had to 
draw a circle and arrow like this, but they all uh, coexist. In concluding, uh, henceforward, I trust Japan will seek to engage in global and regional multilateralism, both in economy and security, and will seek to cooperate with like-minded countries more than ever based on rule of law. John Raggi once argued that multilateralism is demanding institutional form. I agree. Participants cannot expect specific reciprocity but diffused reciprocity at best. I trust uh, this holds tr true today. However, due to the nature of global challenges, rules-based uh, multilateralism has gained its importance than ever. We can no longer afford to deny multilateralism, but have to be proactive in engaging multilateral cooperation if we wish to ably grapple with global issues. Multilateralism is no longer an option, but essential in our global relations and for our respective national interests, as the COVID-19 has taught us. Last slide. I would like to close my talk with a photo of the stone garden in Kyoto Ryoanji Temple. This is a Zen garden created in the 17th century for Zen temple to aid us to meditate and has been des designated as a world heritage. Many visitors have sat in front of the garden and have quietly meditated about themselves as well as the world. As uh, uh, Eva pointed out at the very beginning, multilateralism is a difficult uh, process to pursue and Japan has faced difficulties, but has also uh, exhibited uh, efforts, consistent efforts to support and promote multilateralism. But we have to think deep in order to uh, promote multilateralism. By looking at the stone garden together, I hope we can think together on multilateralism. I look forward to learning from your comments, Professor Hobson, and I also would like to learn from your comments and questions from uh, the colleagues who are participating in this call. Thank you very much, Eva, for uh, sharing the screen, and uh, thank you. Over to, back to you, Eva. Thank you so much, uh, Akiko-san. This was uh, extremely uh, enlightening. I have to say, uh, I was particularly intrigued and, and need to thank you for uh, dwelling into some of the questions that I threw uh, on the to the floor actually in your last in your last section because we can see clearly the the evolution of the approach we can see what uh, how connected it was actually to the Japanese domestic issues um, and uh, you are absolutely right uh, to end on the importance of uh, multilateralism which is something that we share deeply in in the European context and that we share also in our relationship and growing partnership with Japan. Um, but I would like to now pass the floor to, to Hugo Dobson for his follow-up comments directly before we, we open the floor for questions. Professor Dobson. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, let me try and share my screen. Uh, inevitably, the technology will probably fail on me. Uh, never work with children, animals, or PowerPoint. Um, hopefully, you can all see that. Um, so, uh, yes, my name is Hugo, uh, the University of Sheffield, and it's a pleasure to be speaking to you today. Um, I've, I've been interested in these summits for almost 20 years now. Um, it was when Japan was hosting the G8 summit in Okinawa in the year 2000 that I started to pay attention to these summits. And they often, well, it's certainly at that time, often go overlooked. Um, since then, um, I've expanded my research activities to actually uh, begin attending these summits. So in 2008, I was lucky enough to uh, go to Hokkaido for the Toyako G8 summit uh, as a fully accredited journalist. Uh, and I've tried to attend as many of these summits uh, since then. Um, and also I've been lucky enough to be invited to be involved in some engagement groups 
that both the G7 and the G20 uh, encourage. Um, they're called the, the Think 7 and the Think 20, the T7 and T20. And basically it's an opportunity for academics and think tankers to feed their ideas into these summits. Um, so I guess, I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet here, but I guess that's why I've been invited to uh, talk a little bit about these summits. And I just want to quickly say that it's an absolute pleasure to speak alongside Akiko Fukushima. Um, I got my PhD in 1998 and around about that time, uh, Akiko published a book called uh, The Logic of Multilateralism on Japanese Foreign Policy. And it was, it was very, very influential. So I've always been uh, a big fan of Akiko and her work. So it's a pleasure to be able to speak alongside her. And hopefully what I'm gonna say is complementary to what she said. Um, I think she very kindly left some gaps in what she said that I can possibly fill by looking at these summits. So to talk about the G7, uh, first of all, um, this slide that I always use uh, and have to update annually uh, is one of my favorites. Um, this shows you all the G7 summits that have taken place since 1975 in the top left hand corner when it was a G6, it was the leaders of uh, the US, the UK, France, West Germany, uh, Italy and Japan who gathered uh, in the Chateau of Rambouillet uh, just outside of Paris um, to have an informal discussion amongst uh, the leading powers of, of the day. Um, and although it met um, for what was intended to be a one-off summit, it wasn't actually meant to happen again, uh, it was felt to be a useful format. What it, the format was, and I think format is a really important point here, especially when we're looking at some of the other uh, organizations and institutions that Professor Fukushima mentioned. The format was meant to be informal. It was all about the leaders of the day getting together, having a fireside chat, no notes being taken, no bureaucrats in attendance, just a chance for leaders to inject political leadership into an issue. The leaders were meeting at the time of uh, various macroeconomic challenges uh, in the mid 1970s. And the French host, uh, President Giscard d'Estaing, um, who had been finance minister at the same time as his West German counterpart, Helmut Schmidt, had been finance minister. They both became leaders of their countries and felt that the format which they'd had as finance ministers, informally gathering together and talking through the issues of the day, would be useful at the leaders' level. So they upgraded it to a leader's level and um, with no intention of meeting again, it was felt to be useful enough that it did meet on an annual basis. Now the agenda has changed and developed since then uh, quite dramatically. The um, emphasis was originally on macroeconomic issues, but this uh, soon expanded to include security issues. By the end of the 1970s, hijacking um, was an issue that had been put on the G7's agenda. But the feeling was that this was a flexible format that you could use to address the issues of the day as they came up. So political issues, security issues, a whole range of different topics could be placed on the summit's agenda. Uh, it was flexible enough to accommodate um, the issues of the day. Um, it was also flexible enough to expand in terms of membership. So by the following year, 1976, when the second summit took place, uh, Canada joined to form a G7. The following year in London, in 1977, um, uh, the European Union um, gained representation. Um, and then we go through to the end of the Cold War, and in the 1990s, a process began by which Russia joined to form a G8 by the end of the 1990s, um, in 1998 at the Birmingham summit. Now that came full circle by 2014, when Russia was then uh, not expelled, but its membership was suspended um, because of a uh, situation in the Crimea and Ukraine. And that's where we stand, that Russia is still suspended from uh, the G7. And there has been talk sometimes of Russia finding way back there. Um, you'll see if you go to the bottom right hand corner, I've uh, done away with the pictures of leaders and included a picture of Trump, because last year it was the American presidency, um, which um, Basically, this was the year when the G7 didn't happen in a way. There was a brief online meeting uh, early in the year, um, but um, there were plans to hold it before the election and after the election, but it never happened. So uh, later in June, uh, as Professor Fukushima said, 
we'll have the G7 in Cornwall in the UK. And there's going to be a, a number of issues there. COVID, obviously, and uh, post-COVID recovery, how we build back better. There'll be linkages built between this summit and COP26 taking place in Glasgow later uh, in this year. Um, and this is all part of what is meant to be global Britain's uh, new direction. Um, and there has also been talk of possibly an emerging League of Democracies emerging, uh, a D20, um, which I can see there was a comment um, or a question uh, in the Q&A about that, which maybe we can talk about later. But this is how the G7 has evolved over time. And very briefly, if you want to understand this, because it is different from the more formal mechanisms that Professor Fukushima spoke about. All these formal mechanisms have charters, they have a legal right to exist, they have a staff, they have a headquarters, they have a flag and so on. The G7 is informal, it doesn't have those things. And the closest thing to understanding it is for those international historians out there to go back to 19th century history and look at the concert of Europe that emerged out of the Congress of Vienna that brought an end to the Napoleonic Wars. Now, again, this was an informal gathering of great powers of the day who recognized each other as great powers. And it was flexible enough in addressing the issues of the day. They met when they wanted to, when there was a crisis to address, whether it was in Greece or wherever it may be. Um, and, and, and this sort of is the closest thing that we have to understanding the way the G7 functions. The G7 meets because the leaders want it to meet. If, it, if they didn't want to meet, then it would cease to exist. But it has continued. And as I say, we're going to have the 47th summit uh, in, next month in the UK. So Japan's role. Japan's role in these summits, well, you can see its role as a host. So it's hosted uh, six G7 summits uh, since 1979. Um, I've given you some images here of where it was hosted. So the first three summits were all hosted in Tokyo and took place at the uh, uh, the uh, state guest house, the Gehinka uh, in Akasaka. Um, 1979 was a big issue. A, a, a big issue for Japan was that it was hosting the summit. It was the world's leaders were coming to Japan. They were recognizing Japan as a founding member of the G7 in 1975. And now it, it was Japan's turn to host. Um, so it really sort of recognized Japan's role as, as a great power of the day. But the, uh, the issue of that summit was very much about um, oil consumption and quotas were agreed amongst the leaders as negotiations carried on throughout the night. Um, 1986, Nakasone was prime minister and the focus was very much on the second cold war and uh, Nakasone was using the summit to um, reinforce support for uh, Reagan um, uh, and the US. Um, by 1993, the cold war had come to an end and with Prime Minister Miyazawa hosting the summit, Japan was looking at um, shaping the post cold war order and supporting Russia's uh, move to democracy. Um, by 2000, Okinawa was the uh, venue for the summit and Prime Minister Mori was hosting. Focus here was very much on the digital divide and also global health. This summit led to the creation of the Global Health Fund that has generally been regarded as uh, successful. Um, by 2008, and this was the first summit I was able to attend, uh, they went from Okinawa all the way up to Hokkaido. And uh, the focus of the summit was on uh, climate change. Uh, and agreeing to uh, limits on uh, carbon emissions. Um, and by 2016, um, Abe was prime minister again, and uh, Ise Shima, um, the images are going around in anti-clockwise order. So we've ended up in the top right-hand corner, Ise Shima summit. And as Professor Fukushima said, the focus was partly on um, global health, um, uh, global pandemics was an issue um, that was addressed. Um, so you can see Japan generally being regarded as a, a, a positive host of the summit, always ensuring that the summit is going to be successful. If you look at the University of Toronto's G7 research group, they award grades to every summit, all the 47 summits that have taken place or will take place uh, uh, by next month. And you can see that Japan consistently gets good grades. Japan makes it almost a matter of pride that it wants to host a successful summit. It doesn't want to be responsible for a failed summit. Now, as regards Japan's concrete role, I'm just going to identify four things very briefly. Um, Japan tries to promote its national interest within the G7. 
you can see issues appearing on the G7 agenda, which you would not think would be a natural place for um, these issues to exist. So Japan has promoted the issue of um, North Korean abductions of its citizens. Uh, Ratsuji Ken has appeared on a number of summit uh, statements and Japan is trying to secure the support of its partners on that issue. Uh, the Northern Territories dispute with Russia, again, was an issue that appeared on Okay, I don't know if anyone can hear or see me or anything. It seems that we have a, a little technical issue here. I can we see you and I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I think Hugo froze at some point. So we will give him, yes. Hi everyone. Hugo, <laughs> Apologies, I'm, I'm back in the room. Good, 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 please go ahead. Okay, I'll carry on and um, I'll do it quickly so we don't get any more disruption. Um, so yeah, Japan in this image, I'm reading this image to see that Japan is playing the role of um, um, a middleman. Um, it's trying to ensure that the US isn't ex excluded and is trying to provide a bridge, kakehashi, if you like in Japanese, between Europe uh, and the US. Also, Japan is the only uh, Asian representative in the G7, has cherished that role and always tried to have uh, agenda items included. And this Japanese political cartoon I've taken from the 1998 Birmingham summit shows Prime Minister Hashimoto desperately trying to plug the microphone of the summit into a, into a plug hole with a variety of different issues. Um, if it wasn't for Japan, you wouldn't have necessarily those Asian issues um, talked about at the summit. And at the same time, Japan has always tried to be a responsible member of international society, uh, promoting uh, global public goods um, through the G7. Now, I think very quickly, one issue that is key to this is political leadership. Now, the G7 and equally the G20 is all about leaders getting together. They're supported very effectively by their bureaucrats, but this is all about the leaders getting together um, and um, creating the interpersonal relationships. Now, this creates a bit of a challenge for Japan. Um, as we can see here, what I've done is try to compare the attendance of the UK Prime Minister and the Japanese Prime Minister. And you can see that Japan has had a lot of Prime Ministers attending the G7 and G8 summits. So there has been this sort of revolving door of Japanese Prime Ministers, which doesn't necessarily lead to strong leadership in a format like the G7, which, for which political leadership and the Prime Ministerial leadership is so important. But there is a flip side to this. You can see examples like Nakasone, Koizumi, Abe, where you have had consistent attendance at these summits. And they tended to build very close relationships, Nakasone with Thatcher, as well as Reagan, Koizumi with Blair, as well as Bush. Um, so there are opportunities there for Japan um, if the uh, political leadership uh, is forthcoming. Now, moving on to the G20. Um, so, 2008, we see the uh, upgrading of the G20 from an informal meeting of finance ministers to an informal meeting of leaders. Very similar evolution as the G7, going from finance ministers to leaders, but still the same emphasis on informality. This was in response to the global financial crisis. The G8 had met earlier that year in, in Toyako in Hokkaido, and the issue of the global economy had barely been discussed. A few months later, you see the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the G20 has felt to be more effective uh, in dealing with the global economic crisis. It's also seen to be more legitimate because it expands the uh, membership from beyond the G7 to include BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, um, South Africa. It also includes those middle powers, the MICTA countries, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, uh, Turkey and Australia as well as Argentina uh, and Saudi Arabia. Um, but it seemed to be more legitimate. It seemed to be more effective as a crisis committee. And the narrative is that 
the G20 has trumped the G7 and the G7 should logically wither and die, which as we see, hasn't happened. Now this presented a challenge for Japan. Japan tried to do what it's done in the G7. It tried to play those roles, but it was more challenging to be the representative of Asia when you have China, South Korea, Indonesia, India, we could classify possibly Australia as an Asian power as well, trying to play that role uh, of Asia's representative. And Japan lost out to South Korea in hosting the summit in 2010, and it lost out to China in 2016. Also for Japan, that great power status, which was so important within the G7, being a member of a select group and a recognized great power of the day was diluted within a larger forum like the G20. Um, so that presented a bit of a challenge for Japan. And also it was unfortunate that it came at a time when political leadership in Japan was not forthcoming. This is the time of the revolving door of Japanese prime ministers. So the result was a bit of a paradox. Japan wanted the G20 to succeed. It wanted it to address the global financial crisis and was very proactive in providing support um, for the G20 to succeed. But it didn't want it to succeed at the expense of the G7. They wanted to keep the G7 as a group of like-minded democracies, unlike the diverse G20, which doesn't have that glue, if you like, to bind it together. And it wants to place the G7 instead at the heart of global governance, with the G20 as more of a place for consultation. Um, and the G7 would be the, the area for driving forward with initiatives. The G20 would rubber stamp them. So the result was a bit of a constrained role for Japan within the G20 initially. And this was only really resolved, and this is my final slide, was only really resolved with um, the return of prime ministerial leadership, political leadership in the form of Prime Minister Abe. Now, with his return to um, uh, power in 2012, you could see that Abe was able to inject greater degree of political leadership. He was able to manage to navigate the various roles that Japan played within the G7 and transfer them to the G20. He was able to manage the relationship with the US, um, becoming a sort of chief Trump whisperer in a way, managing the disruptor in chief. He was able to represent Asia, invite a range of Southeast Asian countries to, for example, the G20 summit in Osaka. Um, also, as Professor Fukushima talked about, Japan was able to promote a range of issues um, like the free flow of data, which were of, um, well, public, global public goods. Um, so Abe was able to play all those roles, combining it with, I guess, what's been called an Abe doctrine. A lot of people, including myself, have talked about the emergence of an Abe doctrine that replaces the Yoshida doctrine, where Japan is playing a much more proactive role, making a, a greater contribution, um, while still sort of seeking to um, reinforce and reassert its great power status in the world and overcome a number of post-war constraints. And all of this culminated with Japan securing the role of host of the G20 summit in 2019. Now, I think there are questions here about the future. Um, what is Japan's role gonna be like in this kind of uh, informal summit post Abe? Abe was able to create the interpersonal relationships that made these kind of summits work for Japan. Um, is Suga going to be able to replicate that kind of role? Um, and I guess recently we've been, even been talking about the possible return of Abe, which um, uh, remains very much to be seen. But looking at the time, I think I've spoken for long enough, so I'll stop sharing my screen there and um, we can return to the Q&A hopefully. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Hugo. Um, I would uh, probably pass the floor to, to Celine uh, to moderate the, uh, the Q&A session, if that's okay. Thanks. Sure, thanks a lot, Eva. So I'm Celine Pajon, I'm the colleague of, uh, of Eva for the, the Japan program and the VUB. Very happy to be, to be with you again uh, today and very glad to have the dream team of, of speaker for this, uh, for this uh, issue of Japan and uh, multilateral setting, multilateralism. Uh, I found it very, uh, very fascinating the, the way you, uh, you brought us to a journey into the <laughs> Japan 0.0. 
evolution uh, into the multilateral system and also the, the role that it can play uh, into the, the G7 and, and G20 summits. So we have uh, already uh, some questions, uh, so we'll go straight to them. Uh, and I will also inject my own, uh, my own question and my own point uh, from, from, from time to time. So let's start with a question from Maike Verbruggen. She is a teaching assistant for this, uh, this uh, lecture, this series of, of lectures. So um, she has a question uh, maybe for you, Akiko-san, on the human security agenda in particular. And her, her question is, uh, to what extent does the human security agenda live on after the defense reforms that we have seen in Japan in the recent years? And I guess the subtext the sub of, of this question is, uh, do, do you see uh, Japan as, uh, you know, empowering uh, the self-defense def forces more to act uh, on the international scene and maybe to, to act also uh, uh, within a multilateral setting? And uh, does it imply, uh, you know, less attention um, on the human security agenda. So well, well, what about the, the human security agenda? And I will add um, my own observation and my, my own question um, to this. Um, actually, uh, despite the defense uh, reform and the political willingness of the, the, the former prime minister Abe to, you know, to bring uh, Japan back on the international scene, including regarding the you know, more military uh, kind of activities. We've seen the, the withdrawal of the, the Japan self-defense forces from uh, practically all uh, UN uh, peacekeeping operations uh, since the, the withdrawal from South Sudan by, back in 2017. So there, is, there, there are some officers uh, in, in, in some PKOs, but not a significant um, uh, you know, troops participating. So, so what what is your take on this? Do you envision any you know possibility for Japan to get back into the the, the, the UN PKOs, uh, sending troops, or do you think it would be um, well difficult? Uh, and uh, and that actually, yeah, human security uh, issues activities are actually more. Uh, easier way to 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 go, uh, and and as a, just a, a little uh, follow up also on the human security agenda, uh, Akiko San, in your presentation you mentioned that it was uh, actually an important part of the of the national uh, security strategy. Uh, maybe could you um, could you provide some illustrations or of uh, you know what what. Japan is doing or what Japan is planning to do uh, in, in the future uh, regarding uh, human security. Maybe um, if it, it's easier for me to gather uh, several questions and then I will come back uh, to you for, for, the, for the replies. Um, another question uh, is about comparing uh, Japan and the EU. Uh, as you know, both Japan and the EU has been labeling at some point as normative powers or civilian powers. So what you see as, you know, the similarities and, and differences between, between Japan and the EU on this. And uh, of course, uh, Hugo, you're, you're also welcome to, to jump in on, on this one. And um, I would add uh, also uh, one question, especially regarding the style of, uh, of the, the leadership, you know, the diplomatic style of, of Japan. Uh, what, what do you see is the, how, how, would, you, how would you label, the, how would you describe the, the way Japan is, uh, is actually uh, acting in the, in the multilateral setting? And maybe it is acting differently, you know, in, in, uh, in, in Asia or in the, the G7, G, G20 summit, but uh, would you say it's more as a, a directional leader or uh, as you just said, you know, trying to um, you build consensus and be a kind of a bridge, a mediating power. And, uh, and so what, what are the main assets of the, the Japanese diplomacy, Japanese diplomatic style and the main challenges for, for Japan to, to actually uh, exist and push uh, uh, its interest and the global agenda uh, on this. 
and maybe I will uh, end this first bunch of questions with uh, something for, for Hugo on the, the D10 and the expansion of the, maybe the expansion of the, of the G7 uh, summit, uh, as we have a question on the, the report regarding maybe the, the reluctance, uh, certain reluctance of, of Japan to include uh, some other countries such as the uh, South Korea. So what is your take on this? How do you explain this, uh, this reluctance? Is it only about South Korea or other, other, other members too? Um, is it because uh, Japan uh, feels that he would lo lose his uh, status as a representative of, uh, of Asia? So uh, three big uh, questions for you. Um, so who, who wants to, to start the reply? Akiko-san, are you ready? <laughs> Yeah, Ellen, thank you very much for thank all you. the great, good questions. Uh, I'm not sure I can do justice to all the questions posed, but I'll try. And if I miss uh, some of the questions, just uh, please remind me. Uh, let me start from a human security question. Uh, in essence, since uh, we started to put our time and energy on the concept of human security, Japan has never abandoned the concept up till now. And uh, unfortunately, should I say, with the uh, COVID-19, attention is more given to a human security perspective because uh, COVID-19 is not only health crisis, but a crisis across the board from economy to inequality and uh, society as a whole. So uh, if you sit in Tokyo, you hear more of a human security perspective that we have to have in uh, approaching COVID-19 and even post COVID-19. And uh, as for a uh, question about uh, human security and national uh, security strategy, I was one of the drafters of uh, national security strategy. So I perhaps can uh, say things with some confidence. Uh, was that uh, Mike who asked the question on NSS or was it Salin yourself? Uh, it, the text of National Security Strategy of uh, 2013 is available in English. I don't know whether it is available in French or not, but it, at least in English at uh, Prime Minister's Office uh, homepage. And uh, you will find that National Security Strategy has three components. One is diplomacy, defense, and the third is development. And human security is discussed in the context of global security, but emphasis is given to development side. And in, provi in, provi in cooperating uh, multilaterally on security and also development uh, strategy emphasizes human security perspective or put it in another way, human centered approach uh, to the question. And uh, Development uh, Cooperation Charter, which was uh, revised, uh, says that human security is the guiding principle of Japanese development cooperation. We used to call it ODA Charter, but we have renamed ODA Charter to Development Cooperation Charter because uh, our assistance is not limited to official development assistance, but a combination of uh, uh, private sector, uh, civil society, and the government, and even businesses. Therefore, we call it development cooperation. So uh, it is well uh, in it. And uh, Japanese uh, Ministry of Defense also regards human security perspective very important in the uh, activities. Uh, 
related to that point, uh, Celine, you have uh, raised a very important question about uh, Japanese uh, engagement in uh, peacekeeping operations. Your observation is absolutely right. We do not uh, dispatch uh, any uh, troops at the moment, except we send uh, individuals, uh, SDF, uh, self-defense force individuals to uh, PKO headquarters, for instance, in South Sudan, and they are making uh, a good uh, contribution. And uh, this doesn't mean that Japan decided not to send uh, troops. Rather, Japan stands ready to send troops where we can be useful and contribute to peace. Our spirit of uh, being a peace enabler does not go away. And as you might recall, Celine, next year would be the 30th anniversary of uh, uh, Japan's uh, international PKO law. Therefore, we are taking a new look at what uh, Japan should contribute for the time being. Uh, situations do not allow Japan to send our troops. But instead, as I said, another TPP, not the trade one, but the triangular partnership program that we uh, promote at uh, United Nations is a way to contribute in peacekeeping operations. We provide training to peacekeepers from uh, troop contributing countries who are not uh, yet well trained for operations on the ground. And uh, we have uh, courses for uh, engineering, of course, but uh, communication and uh, medicine, medical, and uh, camp safety. And these have uh, turned out to be very effective. When, we, when I say capacity building, it may not be very eye-catching, but unless peacekeepers are well-trained, uh, we cannot have robust operations and safe operations. Pe peacekeeping has suffered from so many sacrifices, so many deaths, uh, so far, and that's something Japan is currently working on, but it doesn't mean that Japan will not uh, send its troops. We are ready to contribute if there are places that we can send our troops in South Sudan. I think we have made uh, uh, substantive contributions to peace building there. I was there to watch uh, Japanese self-defense forces work in South Sudan. I was also in Timor-Leste, for our uh, peacekeeping activities. And uh, I had a chance to meet uh, uh, then uh, to more or less the president. When I met him, I asked him his impression of Japanese contingent in uh, Timor Leste. And he said, wonderful, but I have one complaint. And I went, oh, he said, the price of lobsters went up too high, Japanese SDF, it seemed uh, enjoyed lobsters in Timor Leste and voted too much, but that's half joke. And uh, I think they have made uh, a good contributions. So, Celine, if you have any good uh, suggestions for further uh, Japan's uh, contribution to peacekeeping, uh, please let me know. I welcome your advice. And uh, come to think of it, all member states have. Uh, uh, their own headaches in sending our uh, troops to uh, peacekeeping operations, haven't we? I shouldn't be carried away. And uh, uh, the question on uh, normative power and civilian power, right? Uh, when uh, Professor Hasmo wrote about uh, civilian power and others wrote about normative power, as you know quite well, there were quite a good echo in Japan. And there have been a lot of academic as well as political discussions about civilian power and normative power. Uh, having uh, constraints in deploying our forces uh, overseas, um, we do look into these uh, possibilities as well. But, uh, uh, I think uh, Japan is uh, trying to work closely with European nations or EU uh, because we find ourselves sharing values and uh, uh, visions uh, together. 
uh, upon hindsight, uh, Japan started to have some relations with NATO and close relations with the EU uh, uh, in recent decades. And that this is something we cherish. When, for example, when you read uh, national security strategy, it says uh, Japan will cooperate with like-minded countries and Europe is uh, the very area that Japan would like to work on. That's the reason why uh, Japan has signed uh, EPA as well as SPA with Europe so that we can work together uh, in uh, Indo-Pacific and beyond. Well, I think Hugo would like to comment, therefore, and on the screen. So let me uh, stop here. And if uh, I have missed any uh, important questions, do let me know. Hugo? Akiko, thank you ever so much. Um, I should confess that um, my computer crashed. Um, so I've been out of the room and just come back in. So I heard the beginning of what you said, and then I heard the end of what you said. Um, but what I thought it was fascinating, and one thing that sort of sprang to my mind um, was, I mean, human security has always struck me as being um, sort of Japan's big intellectual contribution uh, to security uh, um, and global governance. Um, and my reading of the situation that is that it's quite successfully managed to maintain that at the heart of what it does, whilst um, promoting a proactive contribution to peace. So the two have sat quite, quite closely and effectively together. Um, I, I was wondering how it fits alongside the responsibility to protect. And is this a more challenging situation where, you know, we're putting the emphasis on the right or the moral duty to intervene um, how does that how does that impact on our on our understanding uh, of human security? Um, and possibly, shall I just answer the question about um, South Korea within a G an expanded G seven and allow Akiko to uh, sort of think a little bit more um, before responding? Um, I mean, so th th this issue about South Korea. Um, being invited alongside India and Australia to uh, next month's G7 in Cornwall, I think is um, okay. So the issue here is that the host of these summits has the prerogative, has the right to invite who they want. So you'll have the core membership, but alongside that, the host can invite countries, heads of international organisations that it believes are. Um, have something to say about the agenda that it has set for that particular summit. Um, so the UK is doing that this year. It's inviting India, Australia and South Korea as part of a sort of D10 or a League of Democracies. And this is an idea that's been knocking around for quite some time. I mean, John McCain, the late John McCain, uh, was promoting a, a very similar idea. Um, but it seems to sort of be coming to some kind of fruition. Um, but Japan has done this. Japan has invited countries to the summit when it's been hosting it. So in 1993, it was keen to have uh, Suharto attend the, the Tokyo summit. Um, and he wasn't able to actually attend summit meetings, but he was able to be on the edges of the summit, on the periphery of the summit. And it was Japan that broke that. Similarly, in 2000, in the Okinawa summit, Japan had made um, uh, approaches to China to see if China could be involved in some way uh, within that summit. So in many ways, it's not controversial. The, the host of the G7 or the G20 will always invite countries that it thinks have a significant role to play. But making them members is a totally different issue. Um, very different to them simply attending a summit. And I think Japan's feeling is that it wants to keep the G7 in particular as a select group of like-minded countries. The, the G7 works and is effective when you have um, as few leaders around the table as possible and that they are all singing from the same hymn book and have a similar uh, outlook. Um, you know, this is the problem with the G20. You've got an expanded group. You know, everybody gives a self-introduction and already you've wasted an hour of the meeting um, in that way. And also you've got Saudi Arabia on the one hand, Argentina on the other hand, 
you know, European members is on the other hand. So the G7, the strength is that focus on a select group of um, powers that have a similar view uh, on the world. And, you know, go back to Russia's membership of the G8. I mean, that was, that was a disaster. And Japan has can quite rightly sort of claim that, you know, we told you so. We said in the 1990s that it would be a bad idea to include Russia within an expanded G8 because it's not, it, it's not the same. It's not approaching these issues of global governance from the same perspective. And Japan was proved right, as could quite, quite legitimately say, we told you so. So I think going back to the question, South Korea's membership is partly a result of that. It's partly that Japan wants to keep the, the summit um, select and effective with a small group of of countries, so it would it would oppose you know India joining or Australia joining because it, it would want to keep the group small. Um, but there is the challenge to its position, a position that it's cherished as Asia's representative, um, and it's brought these issues to the summit. But it isn't to the exclusion of Asian countries. As I've said, Japan wants to invite members along, and it's tried to liaise with Asian countries in having a voice reflected in the G7 as well as the G20, and then reporting back to those countries uh, after the summit. So it's a slightly more sort of nuanced um, uh, situation rather than just outright objection to, to South Korea. I'll stop there. Hugo, do you have uh, some uh, words to add on the Japanese, Japanese diplomatic style? Maybe? Um, very, I'll keep it brief. Yeah. Um, what, what I think is interesting is how does diplomatic style, how is it supported or encouraged or, or stymied by the format of the institution we're looking at? So just, does Japan find a formal institution like the UN a more comfortable place um, because of the, the, you know, the legalistic nature of the United Nations? Or does it find an informal gathering um, uh, a, a more comfortable place. Our sort of stereotypes that we might come out with about Japanese foreign policy suggest that it might like that kind of informal gathering like a G7, but you see the statements of prime ministers who've attended these summits and, you know, they find it, they find it challenging, you know, so some leaders are much more comfortable in that informal fireside chat, building those interpersonal relationships. Um, but some leaders have found it really, really challenging. Um, so I think there's an interesting aspect here about the form uh, of, of the institution and how that then shapes participation. Excellent, thank you. Akiko-san, the last word uh, are yours. <laughs> thank you for style of leadership and multilateralism. I agree with uh, Hugo and uh, in promoting multilateralism, which is a very difficult, hard process, I think we need both formal and informal uh, setups, sometimes multilateral, sometimes minilateral, uh, which shouldn't be exclusive, but uh, should have some opening for the future. And that is the reason why Japan is uh, involved has taken initiative on quad, a quadrilateral meeting, and other uh, ad hoc uh, meetings for the same cause. Japan is anxious to work with those countries who share concerns and uh, share initiatives. That's the reason why Japan emphasizes working with uh, like-minded countries. Um, on the question of uh, responsibility to protect and human security, Hugo is quite right. Japan had uh, some difficulty with responsibility to protect idea uh, because it demeans uh, use of force in the very beginning. But uh, uh, human security's definition was defined in General Assembly's uh, resolution uh, and which puts uh, responsibility to protect outside the scope of human security. For uh, responsibility to protect, uh, Japan has evolved and has come to uh, uh, accept the responsibility to pr protect with that uh, strong uh, criteria of having uh, a security council 
uh, resolution for uh, use of force. And it also emphasizes the importance of protect uh, human security, or protect people from conflicts and try to assist uh, uh, people uh, getting out of the conflict. So that's, uh, that's something that uh, evolved over the years. As a matter of fact, I have had a very <coughs> animated debate with uh, Mr. Lloyd Axworthy when I was in uh, teaching in Canada. He on the side of the responsibility to protect and I was on a broader definition of human security. But I think human centered approach is very necessary uh, over this COVID-19 and beyond. That's how I perceive it. But multilateralism is a very difficult uh, process, but I think it is very necessary. And Hugo and I and Salin and ever and colleagues listening can work together to foster multilateralism. I think that would be our responsibility as well as good for the whole group. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the terrific uh, word and kind recommendation. I think uh, indeed we should uh, we should come together again and, and continue to discuss uh, all this uh, together. I found it very very enlightening, very good discussion, and uh, I think we could have uh, gone on for some more uh, hours uh, at least. So I will now uh, give the floor to my uh, to my colleague Eva for the for the concluding uh, words. Thank you very much, Celine. Uh, well, my task is an easy one, just to thank you both uh, for really taking us on this uh, rather exciting journey uh, across uh, Japan and, and, and multilateralism. As you said, uh, Akiko-san, this is uh, you know multilateral, minilateral uh, mechanisms and ways of engagement is actually something that we have been looking quite a lot, uh, not only as part of well, at the Japan program, but also at the European Union uh, as part of our uh, you know, ways of seeking ways to engage better uh, in the Indo-Pacific, in East Asia and with Japan in particular. So I hope we will get the chance to uh, focus more in detail into some of the aspects that have been mentioned in this lecture, perhaps in, in, in one of the seminar or in, in some of our research projects in the future. I would like to thank also our students. This was the last lecture of um, uh, the course on Japan's security and foreign, uh, foreign and security policy. Um, I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you are ready for the exams. Uh, and of course, if you have missed any of the lectures, and that applies to all of those who have been connecting also from outside the BUB, you have the possibility to rewatch all 10 of them uh, on the Japan program uh, YouTube channel. We will, of course, reconnect uh, again in the next academic year with more lectures. Uh, so please stay tuned, stay tuned and follow us on our social media and wherever you can. We will hope uh, uh, to, to continue providing more insights from Japan, uh, EU Japan and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, with that, I wanted to thank you once more, uh, once more to the speakers, especially uh, have a wonderful evening to Japan and uh, rest of the afternoon uh, to uh, our European colleagues. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much.